Good evening, friends. The Lord be with you. I pray and hope that your uh, Wednesday evening is uh, a time of peace. I, I think that many of us are experiencing high degrees of stress these days. And um, I think we need to take very good care of ourselves if we can and be kind. Um, it seems that our nation has veered from, uh, from one crisis to another. And I think all of the different crises stacked one on top of the other, um, I think they're pretty exhausting. So there are a couple of things that I think we need to remember right in the middle of this. First of all, let's just take a deep breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. And remember that each breath is a sign that we belong to our Creator. In the beginning, the Lord formed human beings out of the dust of the earth and then breathed into them the breath of life. And I think that phrase, breath of life, is, is sort of a, a two-fold um, meaning and welcome everyone it's good to see you all um, tuning in uh, Maria House says she has no sound can everybody else hear me is there something else that I need to do <laughs> um, or is that on Maria's end <clears throat> please let me know uh, one of you when you can if you can hear me but the Lord breathed into him, into human beings, the breath of life. And that breath, first of all, indicates that, okay, we may have a problem. <laughs> Hold on, let me see what I can figure out. Why don't we have sound? But Deb can hear me. Okay. Several of you can hear me loud and clear. I'm not sure what's going on with the rest of you. So <laughs> I apologize for that. The, all of this weather today has made all sorts of wonky things happen in the world of technology and internet. <clears throat> the Lord God breathed. And became and the human became a living soul first of all it reminds us that what animates us is something that came to us from God uh, our ability to live and exist is derivative I believe that with all of my heart that my existence is not independent of God is not purely some kind of scientific biological phenomena, but that every, every breath that I take is because of God's creative genius in the very beginning, and I am continuing to live that out today through the creation process that he set in motion. So life, breath, comes from God. So when we breathe in and breathe out, part of that is just a reminder that my daily existence is derived from the pleasure of God, from his love, from his creative genius, from his delight in his creation plan. And I just want you to sit with that. God is delighted in you. Your life is not an accident. 
Your existence is not an accident. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> a number of people are saying they can't hear me, and others are saying that it sounds good. <laughs> so I am really not sure what to do with that, friends. But I think I'm going to keep going, and uh, we'll see if the mysteries of... Uh, the mysteries of the uh, um, the World Wide Web and cyberspace will somehow catch up with those of you who are having a hard time hearing. The, th the second thing that the phrase, um, the Lord breathed life into the human and he became a living soul, um, I think it's getting at more than just physical life. Yes, our physical life is derived from God's creation and God's goodness. But there's more to it than that. The, the, the phrase formed us from the dust of the earth and then breathing the breath of life is um, implying that we not only need breath, oxygen coming in and out to power our heart, blood, muscles, nerves, etc. We need a connection to the divine source himself. I've been having some conversations with people lately that are very interesting to me. Um as they describe what animates their lives and what their purpose is, um, I, I've been able to ask some pretty honest questions about their spiritual beliefs and so on. <clears throat> and, and what I find is that there's a, a lack of interest in God. Just plain and simple. Not, they're not bad people. They're not atheists. They're not um, radical leftists who want to, you know, argue intellectually against Christian faith. Not that at all. They're decent people. They affirm a lot of what we believe, what we believe from Scripture. But when it comes down to like a personal living relationship, they're not interested. Their life is pretty good as it is. And as I've reflected on that, I have thought, okay, you know, it actually is possible to live a pretty decent moral life without God. I have met wonderful atheists <laughs> who had a strong sense of what was right and wrong and that they should be living their life in a certain way and... Um, <clears throat> I have met wonderful people of other religions who, who had a moral compass. What's different, though, is that um, there is lacking a, a personal living connection between, the one, with the, between them and the one who, who first gave them life. And they have not begun to experience what uh, one pastor called the second wind of Pentecost, in which the, uh, the spirit, the breath of God, and those words are interchangeable in the Bible, breath and spirit and wind, they're used interchangeably in many different places. And we need not just the original creative breath of God, we need the new creative breath of God that comes as he pours his Holy Spirit into our lives. I heard a wonderful sermon once by a covenant pastor, um, <clears throat> Pastor Ephraim Smith. And uh, he preached about Pentecost, and he talked about being a runner. And uh, he he loves to run, and, and he, he said, you know, when you start out and you're 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 heading down the road, um, picking up pace, picking up steam. What a wonderful feeling that is. He said, and then you get, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes into it, 
uh, for some of us it'd be a lot shorter. Um, he said, you get, you get to that point and you start to kind of tire a little and feel like you're kind of heaving and, and, and struggling and kind of like you want to quit. And he said, but then there's that wonderful, wonderful experience in running where you get that second wind. And somehow, I, I, I don't know, I know some of you who are runners who are listening could probably explain um, all of this to us, the, the physiology of it. But, but many of us have experienced that after a while of struggling, if you don't give up, you, you, you gain a second wind and you feel strength and you can breathe better and you, and you can take off and you have some energy. Uh, you've pushed through the difficult part. And, and Pastor Ephraim went on to say, in the Bible, we have the breath of God that comes to us in the beginning, that brings life and creation, but then the rest of the Old Testament is struggle, it's, it's sin, it's darkness, it's wickedness, uh, it's, it's battling Satan and his kingdom that wants to destroy God's kingdom. And, and there's much uh, struggle as the people of God seek to follow him. And, and he says, but in Christ, who not only forgives us of our sins through his death on the cross and through his power at the empty tomb, but in his return to heaven, he, he pours out his spirit, a second wind that can renew us in our strength that can renew us as human beings and help us to <gasps> breathe the breath of God again, not just oxygen, but God's presence and breath in us, reviving us. And what do you see when, uh, when the day of Pentecost came and, and fell upon uh, the men and women who were uh, there waiting for what Jesus had promised? Um, they were renewed in their spirits. Uh, a whole new dynamic took over, whereas Jesus and his earthly followers were a fairly uh, limited bunch. Um, suddenly, with the second wind, the second wind of Pentecost, revival came to this earth, and people began to live uh, in in keeping with with what God had always designed from the beginning that we were to have not just a physical existence but a a physical and spiritual existence a divine connection and it's restored and renewed on the day of Pentecost it's it's the thing that had been longed for uh, we think about the Messiah and all of the promises in the Old Testament about a prophet who would come, or a king who would come, a messiah, an anointed one who would come, <clears throat> excuse me, and bring deliverance to his people. But we often forget that there is a stream throughout the Old Testament of hope. There is a stream of hope that there would one day be an outpouring of the Spirit. One day Moses was in the camp uh, with his people. And uh, some people came running to him and said, Moses, there's some folks out in the camp who are prophesying. And uh, we're not sure if they should be doing that. And Moses said, I, I wish that the Spirit would fall on all of God's people and that they would all prophesy. That it wouldn't be left up to just a prophet here or a leader there, which is how the Holy Spirit worked most often in the Old Testament, coming upon a king or a priest or a prophet or a leader, but not working as directly within the human hearts of his people. And, and Moses longed for it, longed for the day when all of God's people would be bearers of the Spirit and who would proclaim and speak forth the Word of God. You know, one of our beliefs as a Protestant, uh, as a church from a Protestant heritage, is in the priesthood of all believers. And what does that mean? It means that in most religions, 
in, uh, in the history of the world <clears throat> and right down to the present, the way that uh, a religion, religion has been practiced most often is that um, normal, everyday people go to a religious priest, an intermediary, a uh, uh, guru, uh, whatever, whatever it is, uh, they would go to the religious expert and do whatever he said needed or she, in some cases, needed to be done to, to satisfy the divine. Uh, offer a sacrifice. Uh, donate uh, to God some of your harvest. Um, uh, pray these incantations. And, and then the uh, spiritual intermediary, the priest figure, whatever the religion, uh, would, would, would have the connection to the divine. And he would impart blessings and so on. And, and of course, there are two things that happen in that kind of religion. Uh, the worshiper has a pretty light burden a lot of times. You just, you, you, you kind of pay off the priest, do whatever the priest says, then you can kind of live life according to your merry whim. Uh, it also gives the priest an incredible amount of power. The priest or the intermediary or the guru or the, um, uh, the, 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 the I, I don't know, uh, the great poobah of the religion, they're the ones who can claim to speak for God, and so they have tremendous power and influence in the community. Unfortunately, Christian faith also often works like this, where we uh, expect a priest or a pastor or some kind of religious leader to really do the spiritual work. Uh, we want to hear from them. We want to be fed by them. Uh, we want them to pray for us, and we can kind of show up occasionally and let them be the ones to have the connection with God. And we, you know, we can kind of have religion light um, and kind of live as we please. But that's not how it was supposed to be. Uh, that's not how the day of Pentecost sets up the church. Um, Acts chapter 2 says that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. <clears throat> Who was there all together? Well, um, we know that there were approximately 120 believers, uh, give or take. Uh, but on one earlier occasion, there were there were 120 believers that gathered um, in in this room and prayed and studied the scriptures and reflected on Jesus and said, what are we waiting for? He said to stay here and wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Um, so there were 120 people. This included 11 of his disciples. Of course, Judas uh, had hung himself and was no longer among them, but they replaced Judas with Matthias. Um, and along with them were... Uh, the women, they all joined together. Uh, chapter 1, verse 14 says, They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is an odd assortment of people. There are, uh, earlier in the Gospels, there's an occasion where Mary and Jesus' brothers, his half-brothers by Joseph, <laughs> And Mary came to him to corral him and get him home because they thought he was out of his mind. And so they clearly had some struggles with Jesus' mission and ministry and his approach to things. But here, by the end of his life and his death and his resurrection, now part of the group that is sitting around waiting, in addition to his, uh, his male disciples, the other women who followed him as disciples and who were the first witnesses to the resurrection, they're all sitting around together. This is a very fascinating thing. In the Old Testament, as I said, the Holy Spirit would often come down on one person, one leader, 
uh, the tabernacle or temple would be filled with the presence of God, but but there were always limits with with the uh, between God's fullness in the temple or tabernacle or God's empowering of a particular leader and the whole congregation. They were a step down from that direct access to God. But here you have 120 people uh, from a variety of backgrounds, ages, genders, um, some who were with Jesus from the beginning and others who struggled but who kind of came around to his message by the end. And it is upon these people, including his very own mother, who uh, continues not only, who not only gave birth to Jesus, but who helps now to give birth to the church as she waits for the divine Son of God whom she bore into this world to pour out his spirit. Now upon her. Back to chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind, second wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. This is the very thing that Moses had longed for, where, where God's Spirit would fall upon all the people. All the people. You know, I... I think one of the greatest struggles that many of us face is that that horrible feeling of unworthiness. We struggle with sin, we struggle with pride, we struggle with control issues. We're struggling right now in the middle of all of these crises uh, with uh, anxiety and fear about the future and fear for the nation and fear for uh, my own safety or our safety or the safety of loved ones. Uh, we, we, we struggle with uh, concern about justice uh, in our country and the suffering of, of, uh, of, of many uh, in the nation in one way or another. And sometimes I find myself in the middle of the struggling feeling overwhelmed, cranky, tired, uh, not very encouraged, and then I judge myself for feeling that way. Like, oh, Derek, buck up. You should be stronger. You know, God is our refuge. God is our strength. Why are you so downcast? And I think at the root of that is, is this feeling that, uh, that drives many of us that we sometimes, that we somehow have to be this impressive specimen of humanity who's always strong, uh, who never doubts, who um, isn't swayed or uh, discouraged by the events of life and the, the things that come up. Why do we feel that way? We are humans. We are mortals. We're weak. We're creatures who are dependent upon a creator. And yet, one of the most affirming and encouraging things for human beings is that on the day of Pentecost, God pours His Spirit, His divine self, into ordinary human beings. Because they were worthy? Nah. I mean, think about the crowd. Peter, who had denied Him three times, and who was constantly saying stupid things when Jesus was on the earth walking with him. John and James, the sons of thunder. Oh, these people don't like Jesus. Let's call down fire from heaven and burn them to the ground. And there may have been a touch of racism in that too, because the only place where we have a record of them doing that was to the Samaritans, to have that kind of a strong reaction. Um, there was Bartholomew. Or, uh, Nathaniel, rather, who struggled with prejudice. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, that podunk village of uh, people who are backwards and provincial? You know, he is not exactly the kind of open-minded person that you want on your leadership team. Um, 
There were Jesus' family, his brothers in particular, who had uh, criticized him vocally, publicly. And now they've come around. These were not people who were worthy. These were people who had finally wrestled and said, you know what? We, we believe Jesus is who he said he was. We believe that he died for our sins. According to the scriptures, we believe that he rose from the dead. With our own eyes, we've seen him uh, as, as a living being again, and we saw him return to heaven. That's all that they were. They were witnesses to who Jesus was. They weren't particularly worthy. They weren't particularly strong. But they were waiting for what God had for them. And I just want to say to you tonight, um, you may really be struggling uh, just feeling like you're not worthy. That you're not lovable. That what matters most is your own independence and your ability to try to work hard to make a good life for others around you and show your love in that way but you the idea of somebody else serving you just just irritates you. You, you 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 don't feel right taking something from others friends thanks be to god that he is willing to give us stuff not because we deserve it but just because he loves it and one of those gifts is his outpouring of the holy spirit on the day of pentecost onto this group of men and women young people old people who got and received that second wind, a second wind of new creation, whereby they were born of the Spirit, born from above, and began to live life as Paul describes uh, in Ephesians, where they could continually be being feel, filled with the Spirit, um, living a life with the the breath of God, the, the divine presence of God animating them and guiding them, where Paul says in Galatians, keeping in step with the Spirit. I mean, this living, breathing reality. We are not called to a belief in doctrine. And I was talking to you about some of these conversations that I've had where people think they're doing pretty well, living a decent life, not hurting anybody. They would probably affirm that there's a God and they probably even believe in Jesus. That's not what makes a Christian. What makes a Christian is a confession that these things are true, but it's a confession that we live into. If you say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and is now risen from the dead as Lord, that requires a living adjustment where we now are not our own master anymore, but we live according to the pleasure and guidance of another. but a Lord and Master who shares himself, who shares his spirit, who shares his gifts, who shares his character with ordinary people. Yes, there were leaders in the church. Yes, there are pastors, there are apostles, but we believe in the priesthood of all believers that we don't go find our spiritual guru who, has, who can do magical incantations and suddenly Pastor Derek... Uh, will connect us all with God. Nonsense. I'm here to help you get connected to God personally. I'm here to remind you that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm here to remind you that you are the living priesthood of God. That you can have a direct connection to him and that we can uh, have a connection to him together, which is why we're anxious to get back together in worship. Because there is something alive and breathing when the people of God come together and, and, and we each bring the spirit that God has put into us. And together uh, in worship, we're uh, lifted up into God's presence in a, in a powerful way by the Holy Spirit in us. And it's us together who mediates God's presence into this world. It's not just me. It's not Jessica. It's not uh, the retired pastors in our church, the leadership council. Um, it's you. It's you, and it's all of us as we're filled with God's Spirit together. Well, 
I hope that uh, you can encourage yourself that God uh, not only created you and gave us that first wind, and we can remember that every time we breathe in and breathe out, but God has also given us his second wind, the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I think our breath, our breathing can be a reminder of that. Um, some spiritual, um, spiritual writers and leaders talk about breath prayers, where in our breathing we also pray, where we just pause and slowly inhale, and as we inhale, we reflect on God's goodness. As we exhale, we uh, release ourselves into Him. There's nothing magical or mystical about it. The only thing that that kind of prayer does is just slow us down. And we don't have to say a whole bunch of stuff. But we can just remember whose we are, the one who's breathed life into us at creation and at new creation through the Holy Spirit. So for the rest of our time together tonight, I want us to pray um, wherever you are. If you, can, if you can find some space or some quiet, or if you want to come back and listen later, I just want to guide us through some prayer. Um, our nation needs prayer. Um, in so many ways. Our leaders, our nation as a whole, um, uh, we're just going to walk through uh, some of these things, these different categories of intercession. And I will lead, but I ask you to, uh, when I pause, um, after a category, I'll, I will pray through some different categories that I believe need prayer tonight. I will pause, and if you just want to, in your heart or with your voice right there at home, um, just lift up your own prayers about these matters or other things that they bring to mind or whatever it is that the Holy Spirit puts on your heart. But we need to pray together, church. So please join with me in prayer. Oh Lord, we give you praise. We give you thanks that you have fed us with your word, that you feed us at your table, that you give us second wind by the Holy Spirit, not to those of us who are worthy or special, but to all of us who believe on your Son. Thank you for your Spirit. Fill your people with your Spirit tonight. We are grateful for your gifts. We are mindful of the communion of the saints throughout all time and all places. And right now, when we can't all be together, um, we are mindful of your Holy Spirit still drawing us toward each other. And so we offer to you these prayers tonight. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity, and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord of providence, we believe that you hold the destiny of the nations in your hand, including our own. We pray for our country. We pray that you would inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders all across this nation at state and local and federal levels. That they, uh, along with our whole nation, would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. 
so that order and liberty and peace may dwell with all of the people of this great country. And Lord, we lift up the same prayer for the nations of the world, for the poor who are suffering, for disadvantaged nations who are still being overrun by the coronavirus, for refugees, for the hungry, for world leaders. We pray that them as well as our nation, would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Lord, take away the mistrust and the lack of understanding that divides your creatures. Take away the weight of prejudice the weight of injustice, the weight of fear, the weight of violence that has been the story of humanity ever since sin entered our world. Oh Lord, we would be set free. We would love to see one another, our near neighbors and our far, as you see them and as you see us. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your children, made by you, and for whom your Son Jesus died. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Savior God, look upon your church and its struggle upon this earth. Have mercy on us in our weakness. Bring an end to its unhappy divisions and scatter its fears. Look upon the ministry of your church as we go through this time of struggle and concern for health and needing of wisdom to regather and to move into a new time of, of a ministry and regathering in, in, in the midst of a, of a pandemic that continues to play out. Increase our courage, strengthen our faith, inspire our witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children who are listening right now. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior, who has taught us to pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you for your prayers. Continue to pray uh, for the world, for our nation, for God's kingdom to come and disrupt us. And for us to be okay with some disruption and being broken out of our comfort zone and, and open, just open and yielded to however God is wanting to use us right now. Um, we are in the, in the process in June of putting together our uh, regathering plan, putting some final touches on that and gathering some new recruits and getting organized uh, during this month of June. I ask that you please uh, keep praying for us uh, with that uh, in mind, and, um, and we'll have details and dates that we'll be communicating as we get a little bit clearer, but we're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to being with you again. 
uh, if you can stand to actually put on clothes and come to church. I, I, I've been a little concerned at the number of people who've reached out and said, man, I really love just being in my jammies. So, you know, we're going to keep the live streaming going too. <laughs> But I know that many of us are, are eager to, to be together once again, and we look forward to that. Uh, Wednesday, uh, or rather Sunday afternoons at 3 o'clock, I am hosting a group for anybody who wants to come. Um, up to nine of you here at the church, where we will just talk, get together and chat. We'll talk about whatever you want to talk about, whatever's on your mind um, you know, whatever things you want to share that you've been thinking about or going through um, during this strange time of the coronavirus and, and the national upheaval. But maybe just maybe it's more just personal things that you've been observing or, or um, whatever you want to talk about. The Bible, um, a conversation you had with someone or where is God working? All you have to do is contact the church. You can call uh, our office and talk to Linnea, uh, our office administrator. The number is 815-875-2124. You could email her at Linnea at eccprinceton.org. You can go online and contact us through there. Um, we will... Uh, We'll put you down the first nine people that contact us, and you can just come and have a chat with Pastor Derek. We'll get caught up, and um, and and I I look forward to that. So, so please reach out if you'd be interested in being part of that. We'd love to have you, and and uh, we will social distance and observe all that stuff. But for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. Uh, may the Lord turn His face toward you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.